There are few games that have managed to craft worlds, build upon deep, compelling lore, and create engaging, depressing, tragic, yet beautiful stories on the level that the sci-fi sandbox dinosaur game Ark Survival Evolved ultimately reached. I'll be the first one to tell you how many good and bad things have come out of the game as a whole, but in this video, I'm here to do only one thing, and that is to explain the entire story of Ark Survival Evolved in the most comprehensive video that you'll find on YouTube. The story of Ark is an incredible nod to several stories across sci-fi movies, games, and books that focuses on survival, evolution, and ascension of not only humanity, but life itself. The lore of Ark has always been very difficult to understand because of the format it's delivered in, which is exactly why this video exists. If you find it entertaining, subscribe to my channel below to support future content just like it. Now to help make this gauntlet of a video digestible, it'll be broken up into seven sections. We'll start at the beginning of the timeline, providing a deeper look into what sets the Ark universe apart from our own. Then we'll talk about the Arcs themselves, where they succeeded, and ultimately how they failed humanity when left on their own. We'll then move on to the past survivors, the many characters that left journal entries on the Arcs and later Earth. From there, we'll explore the Aberrant Ark and how the events that took place on it would go on to shape humanity's fate, which will lead into the events of Extinction, the survivor's journey, and finally ending with the Genesis expansions. So without further ado, scratch those implants, grab your spears, and let's dive into those Explorer notes to uncover the full picture of Ark Survival Evolved. First, we're going to go over two main things that make Ark's universe a little different from our own if we directly compare the Ark 21st century to our 21st century. First, there is something called an engramic matrix inside a part of human brains, which take a long time to decay, particularly if preserved correctly. This fictional part of the brain allows people's memories and personalities to be stored for as long as it exists. Second, there is a sentient resource that is later dubbed Element that exists in the Ark universe, but obviously not our own, that we know of, and this Element is capable of reshaping itself being a seemingly limitless power source and much more. Now that we've gotten those two pretty major differences out of the way, let's talk about why they're so important and how it segues into the Ark story. At some point around the 21st century, a meteor crashed onto Earth containing Element, and humans discovered it. It quickly became obvious to humanity that this was an invaluable resource. It was self-replicating, could provide power, and was an incredibly durable yet dynamic material. If we discovered something like this today, we'd probably call it a scientific impossibility. Around the time Element was discovered, there were two main groups, or nations, of humanity that had emerged in late-stage civilizations, the United Republic of Earth and the Terran Federation. These two different nations had different ideologies. The URE was more free-minded and found human augmentation to be acceptable, which would eventually lead them into cloning humans and modifying them with element. On the other hand, the Terran Federation was generally against these ideas, and they were more focused on creating technologies and perhaps weapons with element to push humanity into the future without augmenting or changing humans themselves. Eventually, this difference in ideology started an outright war between the two nations, and conflict was sparked. Caught in the middle of this deadly war was a man named Santiago. He was an engineer that was especially good at creating element-based weapons, and the Terran Federation ended up picking him up to work for them. He designed many different weapons of mass destruction which were utilized in the war and created extreme element pollution as a side effect. Eventually, by the end of the war, Santiago was killed, and this may have been why the war itself ultimately ended. After both sides agreed that the destruction was not worth it, they generally made peace, at least squashing the all-out violence. But things weren't just going to magically be okay, because over time, the pollution that was caused by the war began to spread around the planet, decimating species and killing off entire ecosystems. The URE and the Feds both scrambled to figure out what to do, and ultimately decided on launching a project called Genesis, which would involve a giant colony ship to preserve what species they had left and humanity, and send them off into space to find a new world. The URE, though, while being supportive of the project, decided to create a plan of their own called the Arcs, which similarly would act as habitats for different forms of life, including humans to eventually orbit around Earth until one day they could reseed it, hoping that the element would just leave. They didn't exactly have good evidence that that would happen, but the URE especially didn't want to leave Earth behind. So both nations worked tirelessly to quickly build the intergalactic life raft and the Arcs as last-ditch attempts to save their entire species. 
This is when it's a good idea to bring up those engramic matrices I explained before. See, both the Genesis colony ship and the Arcs would end up taking advantage of the human cloning, which had already been happening by the URE, the ones who didn't have a whole lot of boundaries with scientific discovery and human augmentation. This human cloning, combined with the fact that the matrices basically preserved a person's brain for hundreds or thousands of years, meant that people from across history, after being dug up and analyzed, could be placed into new cloned bodies and effectively brought to a new life with the same memories. This capability was a core focus of both projects, as on the Genesis ship, all these long lost dead people inside databases would be tested inside a simulation while barreling across the galaxy to one day inhabit a new planet, and the ones on the arcs would be tested directly on the stations themselves, acting as subjects for an eventual reseeding event on Earth. And to top it all off, on the subject of cloning, not only did the Terran Federation and URE figure out how to bring back ancient people, they also figured out how to bring back ancient chickens, namely dinosaurs, along with a host of other prehistoric creatures like reptiles, mammals, insects, and fish, all to be tested and preserved on both the Genesis colony ship and the Arcs. Ironically, so much of these technologies were powered through Element, but the important takeaway is that this was refined Element, which was able to be used safely compared to the raw Element that was slowly taking over the world and destroying everything. And to add insult to injury, the one who caused so much of that destruction was brought back to life as a clone with augmented memories to help the colony ship during construction. Santiago was respawned. But his mind was filled in with fake memories to make him believe that he'd been alive the whole time to forget that he even died at the end of the war. His project partner, Uma, was a transhuman, a person augmented through brain modifications and neuroprosthetics. Santiago's goal, as decided by the higher-ups who had brought him back to life in the first place, was to aid and lead a project to help decide which life forms to take with them on the ship, and also aid in recreating everyone that lived on Earth. Santiago went about things as he was told, overseeing various decisions and putting together a team. One of his members in particular, named Yonki, started to get fidgety, and when Santiago finally cornered him about why he was paranoid, Yonki explained that he had heard rumors about Santiago having been killed, and how he had a bizarre security file. After investigation of his own, Santiago realized something was off. All the stuff it said he had done after the war was fuzzy to him. He didn't really feel anything about it or properly remember it. While searching through the database as to not seem suspicious, he discovered an anomaly, a combination of two people creating a jointed personality, which will come in much later in the video. Nonetheless, all this human database stuff was freaking him out. After Santiago went to Uma about his concerns, she coldly told him the truth. They gave him false memories to cover for the time it took to back up his personality and grow a new body to put in it. Her response that he should be grateful didn't exactly help either. After overseeing more of the Genesis project and getting glimpses of the Arcs, which at the time existed as a prototype called The Farm, Santiago accepted his fate and came to terms with reality. Unfortunately, his subordinate, Yonki, was doing the opposite. He had discovered that, without their consent, his husband and daughters had been uploaded to the database, essentially meaning they could be put into new bodies on the ship. This was a disturbing realization for the young guy, and he went to Uma to say that he wanted to resign and live out what few years he had left to live on the dying earth with his family. The next morning, Santiago saw young Ki walking through headquarters, pale as a ghost. His expression was all too familiar to Santiago, having only recently discovered his own situation not long before. Young Ki was headed towards the archive room before Santiago pulled him into his office. But when Santiago gave him a hug, Yonki whispered something to him as they were both pulverized into superheated plasma by an explosive in Yonki's vest. Santiago lived out this explosion again and again as Uma watched and analyzed a digital rewinding of his memories to find out what Yonki had said before blowing them both to pieces. Santiago was reintegrated together again and again, the pieces of him flying across the room and coming back together, a seemingly infinite torture. Uma talked to him in this memory, thanking him for the work he did for Genesis, as he told her, Don't worry about me. I'm a survivor. After Santiago's second death, and once Uma stopped infinitely torturing him in the simulation, it wasn't too long after that that the Genesis ship launched from a station on Earth called Arat Prime, blasting off into space to find a new world. On the other hand, the Arcs set off into Earth's orbit to stay right there with the planet and hopefully wait out a long, lonely extinction event while testing survivors in a plethora of different environments to force rapid evolution on them and prepare them for new lives on Earth. But that plan sucked because it was built assuming that the element ravaging Earth would eventually subside, which it didn't. 
The plan was that after it somehow just magically went away, the arcs would come down and reseed the planet with plants, animals, humans, and so on, terraforming the landscape and purging any remaining elements simultaneously. But that never happened, because the elements stayed on Earth and spread evermore through conscious hive mind networks that created gigantic creatures of pure element, later called Titans. The Ark project was made without taking this into account, or they just didn't realize that the element would easily adapt and spread in this way. So for any humans that either did not become crew members on the Genesis ship before it left Earth, or didn't want to just wait out their days on Earth before dying from the corruption, the last solution they thought of was to ascend into Homo Deus, escaping by detaching from their physical form and becoming beings that existed in a different plane of reality. While many became Homo Deus and helped not only develop the system with the arcs, their intangible nature, combined with their skewed perception of time, decayed their consciousness and memories, destroying the person they originally were over long stretches of time. All that's left of a Homo Deus after that process is a shell of who they once were, only able to perform their core tasks in the system, and once they no longer have a task to complete, they seemingly fade away and cease to exist. This caused them to become the shells that allowed the arcs to deteriorate into hostile environments, but more on that later on. So here is where the story splits. First we have the arcs and what we could call the Mark Soskin or Legacy Saga, which covers the island, followed by the first three expansions. Then the two Genesis expansions, which explore the simulation and the ship itself. This saga, or final part of the story, was actually written by another person, Peter Fries. But where do we go next? Chronologically, we continue the story of Ark Survival Evolved on one of the arcs that has a desert-based habitat, commonly known to us players as the Scorched Earth DLC, which is where we get our first taste of the flawed, ever-looming system that ties the arcs together. So go grab some more snacks, maybe a drink, and when you're ready, let's get right into it. The Desert Ark, or in other words what we call Scorched Earth, was a station not unlike the potential thousands of other stations which orbited Earth for a large stretch of time after their launch and the colony ship took off. Scorched Earth was previously run as a Genesis simulation during the Genesis ship's construction. The URE even tested the Magmasaur on Scorched Earth before relegating it to the Genesis sim. This goes to further connect the arcs to the Genesis project in the lore. We don't know much about the diversity of the Ark environments themselves, because we only see three of them up close throughout the story, but they could be wildly different. We do know that Scorched Earth, like the other Arcs, had at least a somewhat harsher and drier environment, different from the island in Aberration, both where we see lush green vegetation. Inside the Ark has a self-sustaining environment, but not by virtue of something as primitive as nature. No, no, no. The Ark created its own creatures that were fabricated in cloning chambers like what are later found by survivors on Aberration. The Ark could also adapt landscapes if it needed to through the use of power structures called obelisks contained inside. These capabilities affected the Ark's primary lab rats. Those lab rats? Homo sapiens. Survivors would wake up with memories of their past lives. Those past lives, at least what they thought existed, spanned all the way from the era of the Han Dynasty in ancient China to the moments leading up to gruesome deaths during the late Tech and Element Wars. This meant that the Arcs had access to a database of people from such drastically different time periods that it could test a near infinite number of scenarios and differences of ideology or understanding of technology to find the most cunning minds that built up the most hardened bodies and willpower. <laughs> I feel like here is where I should bring up the dinosaurs. Why even put dinosaurs on the arcs or in the Genesis simulation and colony ship? Though the URE and feds tried other combinations of humans and creatures, it's later said in the Genesis 1 DLC that the human-dino combination worked so well that they put dinosaurs on the arcs too. Santiago 2.0 even questioned the idea, saying stuff like, what if pterosaurs were still around when hominids started domesticating animals? Maybe that could have led to a civilization better equipped to survive eco-disasters. And say things didn't work out so well for some warrior queen. What if she'd been born with better eyesight or a stronger immune system? What if she had a pet mammoth? Essentially, it was one massive hypothetical executed in the hope that it would give the cloned survivors the previously mentioned hardened bodies and willpower. And in the end, it worked. What didn't work though was the arcs themselves. See, in time, possibly hundreds or thousands of years after they were launched, their overarching system was in complete disarray. The arcs goalposts were constantly adjusted by the system as the element back on Earth prevented their touchdown. At this point, the only remaining directive of the decaying system was to perfect human ingenuity. Speaking of which, let's talk about those humans which the arcs were trying to perfect. 
Specifically, some of them were intent on telling their stories, and they did this through leaving explorer notes scattered around. So without further ado, let's talk about them. John Dakea was an Apache Native American man from the late 19th century turned outlaw in his past life, and Raya was an ancient Egyptian priestess from Luxor in her past life. These two characters had the willpower to progress further than some survivors did, and even document it. But their stories progressed with tragedy like most. When Raya awoke on the Ark, she took to a group and became their unofficial leader because of her high compassion and problem-solving abilities. She was able to communicate with the people from so many different time periods and regions of the world because survivors on the Ark were beamed down with scratchy implants in their arms that gave them an incredible ability to hear any language translated into their head to what they could more or less understand, though context across languages isn't necessarily translated. Anyway, this ability with the implants mostly prevented any language barriers. While Raya was continuing to lead her group to prosperity, at some point John Dakea woke up and quickly took to his old ways, creating a small band of robbers and scouring the Ark's inhabitants for supplies. He was basically John Marston from Red Dead. Eventually he found Raya's settlement, but grew fond of her and her empathy. He reformed his group to do only good in the name of helping the settlement be prosperous, and over time John helped Raya nourish their growing village into a thriving city called Nasti. You can see the city in game here, but as you may notice, it's more than half buried. This was because the Ark system required that survivors not grow too complacent. The goalposts and expectations for survivors were so high that the system had no mercy for when they wanted to prosper and live comfortable lives on the Arks, and Scorched Earth was no exception. It started by sending various types of creatures to Nasti, including Giant Mantis, eventually getting to the point of sending wyverns to attack the city. Raya and John disagreed over the meaning and warning signs, which culminated in the obelisks using their power to sink Nasti into the ground, swallowing the city and many of its inhabitants. This is why, when you go there in-game, you can find tons of buildings inside the cave underneath what little of the city actually pokes out of the ground. After the fall of Nasti, Raya and John escaped with the aid of one of their tames, and John led them to where he thought they would be safe, a settlement to the west. When they arrived, they realized it had become a nesting ground for wyverns, but it was too late. The two lovers were stuck inside a building, and the wyverns didn't give up. Eventually, John and Raya both faced the creatures head-on, and John sacrificed himself in the process, thinning many of their numbers in his final moments. Raya, still alive and breathing, surrounded by dead wyverns, was distraught going on to find the nest's wyvern eggs, which the previously kind and gentle leader was tempted to destroy. She didn't, though. She knew she could use them to her advantage, and so she raised them, promising her beloved that she would survive for both of them. Raya knew at this point what the Ark was capable of doing to its inhabitants, so she hid herself away in the mountains, not to be disturbed for a long time. Through her experience with weapons she learned from John, followed by the trauma of losing someone she loved so much, Raya had the skills and willpower to live on after his death, but she was afraid to get close to inhabitants. At the same time, she couldn't help silently aiding settlements when they were attacked, just like her city had been many years prior. This gave her a mysterious reputation of being some kind of god by the local inhabitants who called her Wali al Aswat, her black cloak adding to the mystery and intrigue. She lived like this for decades, until eventually Raya would go on to meet someone to allow her to open up once again. Within the following decades, we pick up the story on an entirely different arc, this one being the arc you play on in the Aberration DLC. Aberration used to be an arc with a relatively normal ecosystem, similar to the island, which we'll get into later. Like other arcs, Aberration had a barrier creating the illusion of a vast stretch of either land or ocean, and far above was an overseer control center of some kind, probably a lot like what we see on the island. But on the Aberration arc, a population of particularly advanced survivors lived, including Diana Alteris, the strike fighter pilot I mentioned before. She ran into multiple other survivors that she actually knew, including the one she died with, Kazuma, and frickin' Santiago. Yeah, the one who made weapons for the Federation that caused so much destruction. The thing is though, this Santiago only had the memories leading up to his original death, so it was technically not the same guy as the one who was previously revived through the cloning tech to help build the colony ship. 
He's so different, in fact, that his personality is arguably more authentic to the original, since he shouldn't have had any augmented or fabricated memories. Nonetheless, he teamed up with the others, and both the URE and Fetties connected over both sides being, quite literally, stranded. This arc was specifically tossing in survivors from similar time periods, and who potentially knew each other. The common theme? They were advanced, and they knew tech. At first, these survivors didn't realize they were on an arc, because, hell, from their time, arcs hadn't even been invented. After scrounging up enough resources, the tech tribe built an off-brand tech suit and sent Diana into the horizon to find rescue. But then she hit a wall. After crashing into the Ark's protective barrier, she reported back to the others with bad news. They were trapped. The tech tribe assumed that, for whatever reason, they were being held captive in some kind of prison on Earth. So Santiago devised a plan to bring a modular tech bomb to one of the obelisks, hack a teleport into a presumed control center high above them, and then blow up their captors, or at least their tech, once they got inside, somehow getting themselves out before the explosion. That's just like it, isn't it? So they built the bomb, teleported in, and to their immense surprise, they were in space! Their quote-unquote captor, the overseer on Aberration, immediately began to kill the survivors pretty quickly. In response, these survivors desperately set the bomb on a short fuse, diving down to the arc below as the pillar or mega structure the overseer platform was attached to shattered, causing significant damage to the arc's protective barrier. Just, uh, lots of explosions and stuff. After causing this catastrophe, some survived the fall back down into the station. Some also didn't, but those who lived immediately had a horrifying realization. The sun was going to cook them alive very quickly, since without the force field barrier they blew up, keeping them from being exposed to space, the radiation from the sun would eventually burn everything. So they all ran underground into some caves which had already been there. In fact, these were some pretty huge caves that just happened to exist on this arc the whole time. The survivor's hunch was right, by the way. The surface got cooked so bad, it looked something like this. And later on, as you know, this. And that's pretty much how Aberration got the way that it is. The first catastrophe. So now you're probably wondering, okay, where does the island come in? All these characters on the DLC maps are doing all these cool things, like becoming edgy wyvern nomads and blowing shit up. But what about the dossier lady over on the island? What a great question. Allow me to introduce you to an arc with a habitat that mimicked the conditions of a multi-biome island. This is where we meet four important survivors. Helena Walker, an Australian biologist from the 21st century. Sir Edmund Rockwell, a chemist of the 19th century. Li Mei Yin, an ancient Chinese warrior all the way from the Han Dynasty time period. And Gaius Marcellus Nerva, a Roman centurion who had previously lived during the conquests of the Roman Empire. These survivors, over time, established friendships and bitter rivalries, meeting many other tribes on the island, such as the Painted Sharks, Iron Brotherhood, and the Black Thumbs. Though Nerva's army, the new Legion was by far the most important, setting into motion the adventures of the four survivors. Speaking of these survivors, they represent these sort of symbolic pillars of Ark's gameplay. Helena Walker represents the discovery of new things at a basic level, sort of as a blank slate, much like players when they're starting out. Rockwell represents the sort of experimental and sometimes unethical scientists that are maybe in some of us, particularly when we sacrifice our dinosaurs. Mei Yin represents the taming and protecting of creatures and various settlements. And last, Nerva is a man who represents what could be considered the embodiment of the psychological engineering that is the appeal of the knock down someone else's sandcastle game design of Ark's PvP. Before we get into the prime meat and savrut of these characters' stories though, keep in mind once you finish this video, you should check out my series Ark the Survival Stories for a cinematic film-like representation of the story of the game. With that said, Helena and Rockwell, the two scientists, discovered at a pivotal moment that the arcs were unnatural. Helena grew to be fascinated by the creature imbalance and strange environmental abnormalities such as the obelisks. Among the island's abnormalities, inside caves scattered in various biomes were tokens, left behind which they called artifacts. Rockwell focused heavily on these said artifacts. The artifacts were put on the arcs to act as keys, allowing survivors to take on the different guardians 
through the use of the obelisks. These guardians are in fact what we fight in the game as survivors ourselves. On the other side of the coin, Mei Yin and Nerva are the two characters who become enemies after they cross paths in battle. Mei Yin was a mercenary on the island who tamed creatures to aid in her protection missions of convoys and villages. Nerva was a tyrannical leader that carried over his values from the ancient Roman Empire and wanted to conquer the entire Ark by means of dominating any tribes who opposed his own. At some point, Edmund Rockwell was recruited to Nerva's army, which offered favorable benefits for the chemist. Fast forwarding a bit, Helena was with Mei Yin, negotiating with her for help to take down one of the three guardians, the Megapithecus. Nerva, after catching wind of Mei Yin's whereabouts, marched towards the Blue Obelisk and caught them off guard right as they were teleporting back from the fight. His army slaughtered all but one of Mei Yin's creatures and captured Helena in the process. Megan's raptor, Wutsue, was the last creature she had left, and he carried her to safety away from Nerva and his men, dying shortly afterwards in a valiant attempt to protect her from assailing dinosaurs. Megan's raptor, Wutsue, was the last creature she had left, and then he was gone too. Filled with rage, Mei Yin swore to kill the man whose actions resulted in the death of her friend, and she pursued. After Mei Yin arrived at the Red Obelisk, Nerva had just returned from the Dragon Arena after he promptly killed it. Rockwell was doing a great job at manipulating Nerva and his army to seek out the power of the obelisks, falsely promising him that they would give him some sort of grand power. It was at that point that Helena was forced to guide Nerva to the cave in the volcano, which she suspected would take the artifacts retrieved from defeating the Guardians as tribute for opening its mysterious door. Rockwell, still with Nerva, hid his presence from Helena amongst his army, seething with fury that his fellow friend, a scientist and colleague, had supposedly betrayed him by studying the obelisk with Mei Yin instead, who he had significant prejudice against, as he was under this false rumor that Mei Yin was some sort of cannibal barbarian. After arriving at the volcano, Nerva and his army, including Rockwell, ventured into the cave, making their way to the Ark's Hall of History and subsequent Overseer Arena. The observation deck hovered over the Ark itself, being atop one of the three gigantic pillars bordering it. Nerva's army was completely depleted in the following battle against the Overseer, leaving only him and Rockwell left alive. As Nerva mourned the loss of his men, an apathetic Edmund Rockwell was fixated on the metal lining of the walls of what he later called the Starlit Sanctuary. The place was made of element. Hailing from the 19th century, though, he had no clue what element was, nor what it was capable of, or the fact that it was the very reason he had been placed onto the island itself. Waiting to learn more about this enamoring resource, he attempted to investigate one of the nearby terminals, but ended up ascending to an entirely different arc in the process. Shortly after Nerva and his men entered the tech cave, Megan, still stalking the group, found Helena tied up outside the cave entrance and rescued her, insisting they follow suit after him. When they teleported into the station from inside the cave, they discovered the bodies of Nerva's men and creatures, but no sign of Rockwell or Nerva himself. This caused Helena to try and persuade Mei Yin into showing him mercy, but Mei abruptly knocked her unconscious to prevent her from interfering. After abandoning Helena, she searched for Nerva further, eventually finding and wounding the centurion with her blade. For once, he ran, causing Mei Yin to give chase and attack him once more. It was in this confrontation that she accidentally damaged a terminal, which caused both her and Gaius to ascend. Helena, being the last survivor in the control station who hadn't ascended, was faced with a multitude of questions and answers. She eventually found her way to a console and started messing with it. I don't have the answers to any of these questions or the dozens of others that kept popping into my head. But somehow, I mean to find out. Somehow, I'll find the truth. Raya, decades after losing her lover John, and living in the sweltering desert heat alongside her wyverns long enough to look like a raisin, saw two differently timed beams of light in the distance. These pillars of light were a result of both Rockwell and Helena's ascensions. Raya arrived at the first pillar too late to track whoever came from it, Rockwell, but was able to successfully track Helena from hers. Raya was curious since, even in her old age, she had never seen this before. All the while, Rockwell and Helena, both in different locations of the desert, did whatever they could to survive in such a drastically different environment from what they were used to on the island. Rockwell, in his old age, almost felt the intense heat of the desert, but he found a nearby religious settlement that nursed him back to health. Helena also found a group, specifically a convoy, to keep her company and help her stay alive. 
After studying the local fauna and flora of the Desert Ark, Helena came to the realization of how the Arks kept people in their borders, besides the giant force fields, of course. She theorized that, like the island, Scorched Earth had a natural deterrent at its borders. On the island, this was the ocean, which mostly stopped people from trying to escape. Scorched Earth's deterrent was the Endless Dunes, which were home to death worms. These things would devour anyone trying to leave the central desert. Now, while Helena was thinking about the borders and everything, Rockwell, on the other hand, was focused on the element he had seen in the Starlit Sanctuary, which he dubbed Edmundian, because he's a complete narcissist spending most of his time on Scorched Earth deceiving or outright murdering anyone he had to in order to get to Scorched Earth's Hall of History. He robbed the previously mentioned religious tribe, which had helped him, stealing their three artifacts, which they were particularly obsessed with. These people literally worshipped the artifacts, but didn't actually know what they did. Artifacts in hand, Rockwell got as far away from Prophet's Rest as he could, and promptly discovered that the obelisks only required the three artifacts he now had. All he needed now was to find someone strong enough to defeat whatever beast lied in store. He eventually encountered another settlement, though this one was being raided by another tribe, the Burning Phoenix, which resulted in his capture. While captured, Rockwell tended to the other prisoners' injuries to stop their whining. The guards took notice, and as it turned out, the leader of this tribe's wife was pregnant, and they were going to make Rockwell deliver the baby, whether he liked it or not. Now, while Helena and Rockwell were doing all this crazy shit on Scorched Earth, you might be wondering what happened to Mei Yin and Nerva. Let's talk about that briefly before we continue with Scorched, since it happened roughly at the same time. Like I said earlier, Mei, in the process of slaying Nerva, activated one of the terminals which caused the ascension process which sent the two survivors both to the aberrant Ark, the one Diana Santi Santiago and the rest of the tech tribe royally screwed up. Luckily, Mei Yin and Nerva landed on the surface at night, so they weren't immediately cooked. Not that this mattered for Nerva, though, he was dead. Mei Yin sustained a pretty dope scar from her battle with Nerva, and while she was bandaging it up, the sun began to rise. She looked over at him and noticed he was cooking. More than cooking, though, his corpse was on fire! Saying this, she ran for her life. Somehow, despite her armor smoking, she survived and stumbled into a nearby cave. Alone again, Mei Yin explored the Caverns of Aberration, taming various creatures like a Shinehorn she named Xiao, a Ravager named Shi, which later died while Mei was knocking out a Rock Drake with trike arrows, and said Rock Drake, which she named Ao Yue after taming. Look, the arc story isn't always consistent with gameplay. It kind of does this a lot, but the Beast Queen is in fact a beast. Time passed after Mei Yin tamed Ao Yue, and she realized she wasn't alone in the caverns. Someone had left unnatural footprints, and after investigating them carefully, she was discovered by members of the Tech Tribe. She didn't trust their intentions at first, but they offered her shelter, and she eventually agreed to come to their camp with some convincing from a certain ginger pilot. After arriving at their settlement, Mei discovered their tech city and was in awe, particularly because Mei is from ancient China, and these people were wearing glowing armor. Mei Yin's stay was initially reluctant since she felt extremely disconnected from the others and their technology, not just because she hailed from a time long before her peers, but because she had convinced herself she didn't belong due to her beast-like nature. Ever since her time on the island, she had synergized more with dinosaurs than people, being unfairly pushed away and feared by other tribes. This gave her a sort of identity crisis, which the orange-haired woman, Diana, helped her break out of. She was the only one Mei really felt a connection with in the tech tribe, and she taught her how to use their armor in an effort to get her to stay. It worked. So well, in fact, that Mei soon began to surpass Diana with said armor. It's safe to say the two grew pretty close, so when Diana was in danger on an impossible mission to gather element shards from the deepest parts of Aberration, Mei dashed to her aid. The mission to get the shards went really bad, and everyone except Diana and her friend Halsted were killed quickly. Mei met up with them and joined the excursion towards the element shards, causing them to eventually rest in a nearby camp. In the middle of the night, though, Halsted had a baby. Congrats! Oh, sweet mother of God! What the fuck? So, with Mei and Diana being the only ones left alive, they made one last attempt to grab the shards so the mission wouldn't be a complete failure. They got it, but Ao Yue died because there were just too many freaking reapers, man. They made it back to the base and Diana gave Mei Yin a necklace. Totally out of appreciation, not a massive crush or anything. Totally. Leaving Aberration for now, and on a high note, trust me, it won't be later, we catch back up with the Scorched Survivors. Helena was finding even more bizarre and unnatural creatures, such as a rock golem that split her from her initial group, a little Jerboa friend she named Radar who could predict the weather, and giant fucking mantises. 
that she helped fend off shortly after joining up with a larger settlement that taught her how to shoot guns. Amidst the battle, Helena saw Wali al-Aswad from afar, an enigmatic entity considered by most in the desert to be a sort of heavenly guardian. Sound familiar? Helena was curious, so she left the village with a Morelitops and radar in search of Wally, since she had a hunch the mysterious person would be able to answer the questions she had about the arcs. Around the same time, Rockwell was also in search of something. Goddamn Element! Which he finally got a sample of after convincing the Burning Phoenix tribe to fight the Manticore, just like how he more or less convinced Nerva to fight the dragon back on the island. He secretly stashed the element sample and then poisoned the Burning Phoenix tribe before sneaking off into the night. His actions here probably killed the wife of Tamir, the leader of the clan, and the newborn child that Rockwell delivered! Rockwell could kill as many babies as he needed if it meant he could have some alone time with his Edmundium. Anyways, Helena climbed a whole mountain to find the legendary Wali al-Azwad, and when she finally collapsed from exhaustion, Helena heard a woman laughing with bemuse. Wali al-Azwad, or as you should know, Raya, the woman whose story I told previously, was waiting there for Helena. The two of them discussed the arcs, and when Helena told her about what she knew about the arcs, Wali wasn't surprised. It was as if she had seen a whole lot herself. Wali told Helena about some of her experiences on the arc, even letting Helena study her wyverns. Eventually, Wally and Helena found Rockwell wandering around in the desert, having just grossly inflated his fucking kill death ratio, and Helena was just like, Oh my god, it's my best mate! And Rockwell was like, Holy shit, this lady's a fucking devil! She betrayed me! Both of them were completely off from the truth, obviously. Wally didn't trust Edmund, though, mentioning the fact that she saw another bee materialize sometime before Helena's farther away. Rockwell somehow not only played this fact off as some sort of time travel, but he also convinced Helena that he heard she got captured back on the island and went out to negotiate her release with Nerva. Eventually, Helena and Rockwell convinced Wally to take them to where they could ascend and escape the desert arc. It turned out that said place was in the Colosseum of another long-ruined city, the same one John sacrificed himself in. Please, a moment of silence for John Dakea. Helena left Radar in Wally's possession knowing she'd be in better hands, and with a heartfelt goodbye, Wally finally opened up and told Helena her real name, Raya. I have seen so much since we last spoke, John. There are secrets in this desert that you would never believe. Know that I will carry on. Yours always, Raya. Within the arc, Helena and Rockwell couldn't decide where to go next. Helena wanted to go back to the island, seeing as they knew people there. But Rockwell was interested in going somewhere else, an arc containing pools and rivers of molten Edmundium for his taking. Rockwell was like, ooh, that one has fatty Edmundium on it, should we go? And Helena was like, we should go back to the island, people know us. Th that wasn't a question, Helena. After Helena and Rockwell ascended to aberration from the scorched earth hall of history, they were originally split up. Rockwell took note of the fascinating caverns and potential of vast quantities of Edmundium that were then just within his reach. It did not take long for Helena and Rockwell to find each other, and they survived, making small camps and fending off what Helena referred to as flying squid bat murder monsters. Eventually, the two were caught off guard and fled from a pack of seekers that nearly tore them to shreds. But before they could, a woman in glowing tech armor interrupted the attack and obliterated the creatures. This woman was none other than Li Mei Yin. Helena was ecstatic from seeing someone she knew in such an unfamiliar place, but Rockwell was furious. If you recall, he thought of Mei Yin as a barbarian woman. Her clear mastery of tech armor, element-infused equipment, made Rockwell especially pissed. Mei Yin introduced Helena and Rockwell to the tech tribe at a small outpost, and this got Rockwell's attention, big time. Helena was curious too, but she was especially fascinated by the people, and how they were from the future of her own time. The tech tribe took them back to their main base, and Rockwell and Helena were shown around the city. Rockwell immediately took to advanced technology, and was enthralled by the villagers' laboratory, where he began to study their tools. Elsewhere, when some of the villagers took Helena to the portal, the gateway project they'd been working on, she suddenly remembered what had happened with Raya and Nasti back on Scorched Earth, frantically telling the tech tribe to halt progress in the device because the obelisks of the station could destroy them. Her pleas made it through to the tribe, and Diana Alteris, one who had particular influence, listened intently. The tribe agreed to halt progress for the time being, to be safe. After experimenting with Charge in the villagers' laboratory, Rockwell himself traveled to the Gateway Project and thought it was rather bizarre, considering he didn't understand how they could possibly want to leave this arc, one with so much potential for power he saw through the presence of Edmundium. 
Rockwell continued to manipulate and persuade the tech tribe, and especially Diana, to see to his every whim for that ultimate goal. Meanwhile, Helena and some of the others were still focused on the Gateway Project, and they decided to send a trio out to investigate the obelisks for their potential danger, while looking for solutions to the issue. Helena needed to learn how to use the tech armor the others wore to survive, you know, the surface and all that. So, after lots of training and tripping over herself like a drunken dodo, Helena, Mayin, and Santiago embarked on a trip to the surface. This is when Helena started to become familiar with Santiago, who at this point was established in the tech tribe as one of their main engineers. While Helena was worried about leaving Rockwell alone, especially given how obsessed and engrossed he was in the element, they had a mission to see through. Needless to say, this was perhaps one of the single most important mistakes Helena made that caused ripple effects for many years to come. Now this is where Helena and Rockwell split up, but both continue their notes. I'm going to cover one at a time, starting with Rockwell. After convincing Diana and some of the others to take him to the deep caverns where element ran in abundance, Rockwell's mind raced with ideas. He collected multiple samples and returned to the city. The villagers had become worried with the amount of time he had spent with the substance, explaining how dangerous it was. This enraged Rockwell further, making him more paranoid that they might try and take it from him. He distracted the villagers with a side project though, something he discovered called Plant Species Z, which could give off charge as a kind of bioluminescent sentry. This gave Rockwell more time alone with his Edmundium, and in brainstorming new ideas to use the substance, he decided he would test it on one of the villagers' small pets. After kidnapping the creature and injecting it, Rockwell watched as the light pet transformed into a disgusting, mutated beast, which fascinated the old man, of course. Diana found the horrific scene and put the creature out of its misery, scolding Rockwell afterwards. At this point, Rockwell understood how to convert solid element into a liquid form that he could use for purposes like what he had done to the light pet. In a desperate attempt for power, control, science, but most of all, godhood, Rockwell began injecting himself with the element. The rest of the tribe somehow didn't take notice of this, and like many of you have commented, somehow didn't lock him up. So, therefore, after cutting off the blood supply to his arm and transforming the limb into a disgusting, element-infused noodle, he was ready. Rockwell took a big old batch of Edmundium and shot it up like the addict that he was. On this day, on this glorious day, I ascend. Okay, now pause. Let's see what Helena was doing during all this. After she, Megan, and Santiago had left the tech city, they made it to the surface and Helena observed that, in fact, they would cook if they went outside during the day. They camped just inside the cave until it was nightfall, and the three made a dash for the obelisk, where Santiago gathered some data about what the obelisks might do. After they got back to their camp, they discovered the obelisk were highly unstable. Santiago reported their findings to the village and promptly came up with a plan to shut down the obelisks, which would require teleporting from the obelisk into the heart of the station itself. So they waited for nightfall once again, made it to the platform, and hacked a teleport into the unknown. The three teleported into the station, a dark, mysterious, and curious place. This was deep within the Ark somewhere, and the survivors made their way through, discovering facilities that contained pods of dinosaurs and creatures like reapers. It was all starting to make sense, but after making it to the next major room, each of the survivors had a disturbing realization. Along the walls, packed in like products to be shipped, they saw Homo sapiens. Nobody was ready for the cognitive dissonance that ensued, and Helena was especially worried about Mei Yin, given how crazy all of the technologies would have already been for her being from ancient China. The three continued on in low spirits, but eventually they found a control room. In it, they finally shut down the obelisks, but something wasn't right. Suddenly, the station sent up warning signs and unleashed a horde of reapers after the group while they ran for their lives. Santiago hacked a teleport out and the three barely made it out in time, covered in alien guts. Their mission was a success. In better spirits, and coming to terms with the fact that Helena and the others may very well be clones, they reported to the village the good news and began to head back. In a sudden and chilling emergency call not long after, the three listened as people were screaming and yelling over the radio, someone mentioning Rockwell. And this is where we converge on the timeline. After turning into a monster, Rockwell ravaged the city as Helena, Santiago, and Mei Yin dashed back as fast as they could. By the time they arrived, they found an eerie sight. The city was in ruins, with fire, debris, and bodies littered about. Diana was found dying on the ground, and May rushed to her aid. 
Before dying in Megan's arms, Diana said the name of the monster that had done this. His name was Edmund Rockwell. <laughs> Don't leave me. After Diana died in May's arms, the warrior became unresponsive. She took every weapon and able-bodied tame they had and rushed after Rockwell, filled with a rage Helena had never seen before. Helena was torn, conflicted, between the thought of shooting her old friend while knowing that it was her fault for bringing him to the city and the aberrant Ark in the first place. Filled with determination, Helena chased after them, and she eventually found Megan in the midst of a battle against Rockwell deep in the caverns. Helena got a good look at the twisted monstrosity Rockwell had shifted into at this point, and the two women worked together to bring him down. In his fury, Rockwell created a hole in the cavern floor. And with one final blow, Mei-Yin forced him through it. but I managed to catch her arm just in time. Thank God I did. If she'd fallen, well, I'm just glad it's over. After Rockwell caved in the floor beneath him and fell deep inside the Ark, he began to integrate into the system. Perhaps at this point, because the Overseer had been destroyed by the Tech Tribe in the distant past, the Ark was missing an Overseer. In Rockwell's integration with the Ark, he became the new Overseer, either fully replacing it or integrating with anything left behind of its controls or personality. Rockwell remained trapped within the station for many years, able to feel everything within it, every creature, including humans, that lived within the Ark. Exhausted, Mei-Yin and Helena made it back to the destroyed city, still in shock and clearly traumatized from everything that had happened. Helena apologized to the man Rockwell once was, a final goodbye to her old friend in one of her last notes on aberration. Santiago and the others began working on finishing the Gateway Project, since at that point, the obelisks were not a direct threat. Helena wanted to stay behind, feeling like she didn't deserve to go with them, but Mei Yin insisted that they stick together, saying that she'd already lost too much. With Helena deciding to stay with the group, those in the Tech Tribe who were still alive after the massacre finished the Gateway Project and set their sights on their destination. Earth. No casualties or unexpected complications, but <laughs> the target location was off by 8.93 meters. I wish I could correct it. Long after the Tech Tribe left Aberration and beamed themselves onto the extinct Earth, a new group of survivors awoke on the abandoned station. These are called the graduate students, which means they were around the ages of 22 and older. Hell yeah! There are six separate graduate students, and to ensure this part of the story doesn't drone on too long, I'm gonna do a little lore speedrun. This is graduate student Sky. They have one explorer note, and in it they talk about how they had a trippy dream in a place that is a direct reference to the terrible asset flip of a game, Arc Park VR. Sky decided that Aberration 2 was a dream, and they promptly jumped off a cliff to their death. It really sets the stage for the common theme of death for the rest of the graduate students. The other five are actually connected, where one after another they each die, usually a horrible death, leaving the next one with some kind of lesson to take on. These include Rusty, Emilia, Boris, Trent, and Imamu. It started with the Kentucky-born Rusty Stafford, where over time he became very paranoid, and while him and Boris were out scouting, he fell off of the ledge and was immobilized. Boris killed him. And ate him. Then Emilia Mueller became the main character. She was a timid and socially anxious person who always seemed to feel like she was a burden on the group. Eventually she sacrificed herself to save the group from a pack of nameless that, if not for her actions, may have killed the others too. From there, Boris picked up the torch, but he quickly became obsessed with exploring the depths and heard whispers and noises in his head from who he called the Master, which eventually compelled him to betray the others and go off on his own to find more artifacts, which eventually led him to his death by something as typical as a pack of ravagers. 
Next, Trent, which is basically Ark's own scout from TF2. Grass grows, birds fly, sun shines, and brother, I have a laser gun! Decided to continue the mission Boris had, since Imamu, the smartest of the group, thought it was the best course of action, though they were a little bit more careful. The two of them found the abandoned tech city that had been left behind by the past characters, and found freaking laser guns! Teamwork and freaking lasers, baby! While searching for the artifacts, Trent got Reaper impregnated and had his own little baby. You should know how this goes by now. So with the Mamu being the last graduate student alive, he gathered the final artifact and took his pets down to the Rockwell Terminal with him to uncover what they had been building up to this whole time, feeling like he would rather face what was down there, the Master, than to perish by any of the means that had killed all of his lost tribe mates. After he made it to the Terminal, this happened. It's been ages since I've seen one of you. Those others, they left me up here to die. Somehow, Imamu wrote an entire entry in his note and drew this cool illustration while evading Rockwell, an impressive feat of its own, until he got crushed. That concludes the graduate student stories, a tale as old as time, one of miscommunication, mistrust, and ultimately where those things can lead people down in the most dangerous places. And with it, that concludes the story of Aberration. Arriving on the extinct Earth, Santiago and the remaining tech survivors almost couldn't believe their eyes. They were on the planet with a few creatures, supplies, but not much else beyond that. They found a large crater and began to set up shop in it. Santiago acknowledged that, in fact, the planet had to be Earth. His readings on soil composition and atmospheric pressure were undeniable. They also, of course, noticed the city, one which Santiago thought was potentially built on an element vein. After doing many readings of the area, Santiago came to terms with one very difficult fact. He theorized that due to the vast quantity of element in the area, what he called a scientific impossibility, the spike in proliferation, was caused by a century of open warfare with element-based weaponry, the best of which was made by him long ago. This thought spiraled Santiago into digging deeper within his past. Were his memories even real, he asked. If they were, was he responsible? the one that was living, breathing, and writing his thoughts in his journal entries? These thought processes prodded at Santiago throughout his stressful leadership tasks, because after Diana had died, Santiago basically became the de facto leader of the group. After establishing Camp Omega, the group found monsters in a cave, including enforcers and defense units, but on the horizon they spotted some gigantic beasts that dwarfed anything they ran into at that point. This caused Santiago to realize they were gonna need much bigger firepower. It didn't take long for Santiago to come up with a wild new idea, though. A vehicle that took on a humanoid shape. Giant bipedal battle mechs, to be specific. Santiago really liked this idea, saying, Some people may call that fighting fire with fire, but I call it fighting a small gun with a much bigger gun. And so, Santiago got to work on the mech project. He enjoyed the grind, with just how much work it took. Those blood, sweat, and tears all went into him developing modifications, modules that allowed the mechs to shoot rockets, you know, use swords, cannons, and so on. These are the types of mechanics you may be familiar with based on the mechs that survivors can actually use in Extinction. He designed four mechs, which together would ultimately be able to fuse into something called the Mega Mech by teleporting together into a giant mech capable of fighting the largest monsters. These individual mechs would need pilots, and after designing accessibility features for the rather unprepared pilots he knew would be his only options, Santiago began testing them on the best in the group. Profile 1 covered Mei Yin, who was objectively their best close quarters fighter, clearly a top candidate. The next profile covered Helena Walker, which Santiago realized could be a huge asset due to her bizarrely high synchronization ratings which maxed out every gauge. Santiago claimed it was as if her nervous system is more advanced than everyone else's, like they can just process information at a higher rate. Why Helena was like this, I'm not exactly sure, but I guess she was just lucky. And this aptitude contributed to a critical moment later on. The third mech pilot was chosen as Takaya Kazuma one of Diana's friends from the URE, and who Santiago called a loud, obnoxious, self-righteous lughead. While he wasn't a fan of the dude, Kazuma was solid with his sync scores and was one of the only remaining survivors they had left with real military training. 
The last mech pilot was none other than Santiago himself. While he was opposed to using his own creations, they didn't have anyone else who'd be qualified enough, so it just worked out that way. After choosing the pilots, Santiago began phase three of the mech construction project, where he focused on tuning the mechs to the primary pilot's preferences and behaviors to maximize their combat efficiency. He trained hard with Mei Yin, but Helena was having a rough time. He realized that she wanted to discover the truth behind things. That was her tick. In an effort to motivate her, Santiago mentioned a signal he had detected out in the wasteland, and that really got her going. Near the end of the project, Santiago ran into countless bugs and engineering errors, causing him to fly into a rage while doubting his own skills. He tried again and again, and after passing out while trying to fix things, he woke up being dragged off by the others hastily. By the time he came to his senses, he found a cake in front of him. The tech tribe decided that June 26th, that day was Santiago's birthday. The sarcastic engineer squirmed, but the others laughed, got him to take a break from his work and eat some cake. That break, it turned out, was exactly what he needed. And not long after, Santiago found the solution to the issues he was running into with the mechs. Things were getting better, and after simulating the mega mech fusion procedure a few times, the four pilots felt like they had it down. But something wasn't right. It's too soon. They found us too soon. The tribe detected a horde of monsters heading right towards Camp Omega. Mechanized drones and mutated animals, more than they were ready for. Only one of the mechs was ready, Santiago's. He insisted that the others had to survive, and so he came up with a plan to distract the monsters and lead them on a chase while the others escaped into the wasteland. I'd have liked to see it, but more than that, I'd have liked to experience that moment where we all fused together for real and our bizarre little squad became the most powerful team the world's ever seen. But if it means giving these idiots a chance to survive this, then I'll give it all up. Because in the end, those are my idiots. Mei Yin, Helena, and Kazuma finally powered on their mechs and fought off any stragglers who were after them as they fled with the other survivors to the wastes. Santiago was nowhere to be seen, as he had dragged off as many of the creatures away from the others as he could. They ran into more corrupted and smaller titans, acting as training to continue getting used to the mechs. Helena tried to lighten the mood at least with the odd joke, coming up with some tag team moves for her and Mei Yin and their mechs. Mei Yin was having none of it, but they eventually pulled off the may I help you maneuver as they finished off another corrupted creature. The group eventually came to a cave where they started to talk about what to do next, hide in the cave and try and survive or head to the signal. Helena was adamant about going to that signal and didn't like the idea of just hiding out until they potentially met their untimely deaths by more of the creatures. Mei Yin, while at first agreeing with the rest of the group, was eventually convinced by Helena's reasoning and they headed out to follow the signal. After lots of traveling, they eventually saw a giant monolithic structure on the horizon, perhaps much larger than the Extinction City we see in-game. Due to the entrances being too small for their mechs after they arrived, the group left the mechs outside and explored the ruins the signal was coming from. Eventually, they found a server room which allowed Helena to finally uncover the meaning behind the arcs. She learned about the reseed protocol, why the arcs were made, everything. Eager for more data, she eventually followed Mei Yin into a small room that housed a floating artifact pulsing with energy. After touching the artifact, it shattered into pieces, and in its place was a small diamond-shaped object, what Helena called a prism of raw cosmic energy. This is the point that Helena's mind started to fade. She began to have visions with dark creatures, a man made of light, an ascension tomb. Mei Yin, worried about her friend, was especially protective about the gemstone, which prompted her to keep it away from Helena. Unfortunately for them, it was too late. The corrupted monsters were coming, fast. Kazuma had spotted them on a scouting run, and after reporting back, Helena and the others geared up and left as soon as they could. While resting along their way out in the wastes, Helena had another vision, one where she was climbing a ladder of light with titans beneath her. Even the largest of them couldn't reach. She was carrying someone up the ladder with her, but she didn't know who. After waking up, Helena realized that the monsters were gaining on them, and this ultimately prompted a battle. The largest titan they had seen was there, and with his horde of monsters, the tech tribe simply couldn't stop the attack. Kazuma was killed. All of those on foot were brutally slaughtered, and Mei Yin and Helena were the only ones left alive. Right before Mei Yin was crushed in her mech by the King Titan, Helena opened up her mech and placed the prism she had previously stolen back from Mei Yin into her implant. When she did that, the Titan screeched in agony, even causing the King Titan to fall back. Helena passed out, and Mei Yin used that moment to cradle her in her mech's hands and flee. In a critical moment of weakness, that's all she could do. I'm sorry, Mei Yin. I'm sorry. The weight's all on your shoulders now. There's no one else who can carry it. 
tomb. The throne. You have to reach it. You have to take me there. To the tomb of Ascension. I can show you the path, but you have to walk it alone. I wish it weren't true. I wish I could give you wings. But I believe in your heart. So believe in mine. One last time. I need you to believe. Please. Please. After they escaped the Horde, Helena, slipping in and out of consciousness, explained that May had to get her to a place called the Tomb, and veins of light began to creep across Helena's skin. Mayan did not hesitate in taking her. Helena was all she had left, so she continued pushing forward in their only mech, while carrying Helena to the Tomb based only on poorly made maps she had drawn. Eventually, they began passing through an arctic biome, which took its toll on Mayan's mech. It ran out of element and shut down. This meant that Mei Yin had to journey on foot into the surrounding area to find more element and supplies. She suspected her arm was broken on top of that. After getting her hands on element, Mei Yin returned to her mech, barely clinging on to life. She somehow managed to survive attacks against mana garmers and even tamed some to recruit into an army of creatures that she slowly amassed. Not long after this, Mei tamed snow owls and thorny dragons to join the team too. Before long, a dying Helena wounded Mei and her tames made it to the sunken forest, where Helena said the Tomb of Ascension would be found. Ahead of them was a cave, and Mayin cleared it out before going in with Helena. They found the altar, a long bed similar to the tech sleeping pods their old tribe mates used to use. May placed Helena on the central altar, and she stabilized, prompting the whole room to glow. May's heartbeat slowed to a serene, steady beat, but not for long. The Horde was once again on their tail, and Mei left the cave to join forces with her tames. With all the strength she had, Mei Yin held the Horde off with her creatures. Many of her forces lost their lives, and her mech began to break down. Exhausted, wounded, and filled with determination, Mei slayed the last of the minions, and all that remained were the towering titans that had waited in the back, the largest of them all. One grueling battle later, Mei Yin slaughtered every last one of them. Her mech was almost completely destroyed in the process. As soon as she had enough energy to move, Mayin stumbled back into the cave where Helena had been resting. In the tomb, she found a chorus of light. Helena's body was glowing like the sun, floating above the altar. By the time the whole room flashed, Helena's flesh turned to light, and in a swift movement upward, she vanished. The room's giant crystals died down, and Helena was nowhere to be seen. Mayin couldn't help but mourn. She had nobody left, and questioning why she should even still be alive, Mayin left the cave, got in her mech, and marched. Directionless, suggesting that she just wander into the wasteland and die, Mei Yin left the sunken forest, and not long after, her mech stopped moving. She was running out of supplies. Bruised and damaged, Mei Yin fell asleep. She awoke to the sound of earth-shaking footsteps. A large monster was looming over her, and she quickly sprung into action to fight against its horde of minions, but she knew that she wouldn't last long. Suddenly, a mech crashed into the ground and destroyed the creatures with force. Mei Yin was in disbelief. Who could that possibly be? When the mech knelt down and opened up, Mei saw a woman with hair the color of tangerines step out. It was none other than Diana Alteris. Okay, now if you're sitting here wondering how the hell Diana's on extinction, let's rewind, but through her perspective. Diana awoke on extinction, confused and butt naked. She realized she was on Earth pretty quickly, but didn't understand why she was alive because as far as she remembered, she died on aberration in Mei Yin's arms. But she heard a voice in her head, describing it as having someone write invisible words on the back of her head that she could feel within her. The voice wanted her to help and to go somewhere, and when she asked if the voice was what brought her back to life, the voice said yes. Of course, this voice is Homo Deus Helena Walker. Diana presumably woke up after Helena ascended. In a desperate attempt to help Mei Yin, Homo Deus Helena reached into the system and brought Diana back to life a feat which the newly created Homo Deus would not be able to pull off again for a very long time. Diana didn't know it was Helena, and simply followed the voice, because she trusted it. It was all she could do at that point. Over time, Diana gathered some equipment in the abandoned city, and eventually came across tracks and evidence of the tech tribe. It didn't take long for her to find a broken down mech, followed by Santiago. She solemnly buried the lost engineer and vowed that she would fix his broken mech and use it to the fullest, showing off what his last brainchild could really do. In Santiago's repaired mech, Diana followed the voice's guidance, and when she spotted a survivor fending off a horde of creatures, she immediately knew who it was. Diana saved Mei Yin and hugged her. Distraught by everything that happened, Mei was in shock and disbelief and gave in. She explained it all, and Diana understood. Her friends were all dead, Helena was, as far as they knew, gone, 
and it was just them, and the weird voice in Diana's head. The voice promptly told them to go to a facility, and after Mei Yin started to hear the voice too, it didn't take a lot of convincing for them to head there. Once they arrived, Diana sifted through a huge amount of data and came to learn about the reseed protocol, the element spreading into the crust, and the fact that the titans, their huge quantity, was preventing the arcs from coming down and purging the element, thus reseeding the earth. One titan in particular was leading the hive mind. Also, they learned about a facility called Arat Prime. The voice told the duo that they should go there. The only problem was that it was on the other side of the planet, and to make things worse, the King Titan was approaching once again. Diana was fearless, though. In understanding Santiago's original plan with the Mega Mech, Diana and Mei Yin dashed to the site where their tribe mates had died in the previous battle against the King Titan and found the bodies. It was hard on Diana, seeing the people she had spent years with on Aberration dead. But she had a mission. Diana repaired the two lost mechs that had previously belonged to Kazuma and Helena, and came up with a plan to fuse them together and pilot the Mega Mech with Mei Yin. Despite their lack of having two other pilots, the Mega Mech would be operational, at least to 70% of its capacity. Diana decided she would take over for 75% of the mech's controls, and Mei would take over for the rest, specifically using the giant skyscraper of a sword. The King Titan was approaching, but together, Mei Yin and Diana fused their mechs with the others and formed the Mega Mech, which they used to defensively destroy the King Titan's horde and promptly go on the offensive, striking their foe with everything they had. They carved an X into its chest and significantly wounded the kaiju more than Diana suspected it had ever felt before. The King Titan retreated, and the Mega Mech was rightfully just about ready to fall apart. But they did it. With the King Titan fended off, Diana and Mei Yin buried their lost friends and looked towards the horizon. The two of us are going to do what we can to help, but it won't be enough. You see those huge, ugly monsters out there? They need to be cleared out, or Earth can't recover. Also, if you see one with an X-shaped scar on its chest, do me a favor and flip it off before you finish it. We'll do our part. The rest is up to you. Good luck. With Diana and Megan heading towards Arad Prime, while being guided by the voice in their heads, that voice was probably doing a whole lot of other stuff at the same time. While Helena Deus had only just begun her glowy spirit lady journey, she was working on something new to help survivors on the Arcs come down to Earth and aid Diana and Mei-Yin in destroying the Titans and saving humanity. This something was in fact her repeated attempts to replicate what she did in bringing Diana back to life. If she could aid the survivors up on the arcs with respawning, such as she did with Diana, this would give them a much better chance at saving the Earth because death would no longer be a barrier. If Bob could just respawn after getting mauled by a raptor, then he suddenly has a much higher chance of being able to at least build a frickin' hut before something else finds its next meal. That said, after many failed trials of attempting to get survivors to respawn, it actually began to work. First, one success, then an entire group, a generation, and finally, you. You were one of the survivors with the power of trying again, and it started on the island. This time, it was for an exact purpose. Maneuvered and twisted against the system subtly by an entity called the One Who Waits. This character was of course the transformed essence of Helena Walker, a woman you should know well by now. But when she ascended, she lost her physical body and entered a lonely existence. She was the last to be made into a homo deus. Her ancestors were all but decayed. They couldn't speak to her. So there she was, all alone, facing an intensity of information flow no human could even fathom. After allowing you to respawn, she spoke to you in one-way messages, left behind in mysterious explorer notes. All you knew then was that you had to stop a cataclysmic and irreversible event, the extinction of the Earth. She encouraged you to keep pushing on and to work with others to survive like she once did long ago. So on the island, your trials began. You created shelters, fought dangerous primeval creatures, tamed those that could bend and break to your will, and conquered a land with danger around every corner. Along the way, you died, whether from hunger, from punching trees too many times, or by slipping off a cliff and breaking every bone in your body. But you tried again. You sought caves and the artifacts within them, and with your army, you presented tributes to the obelisks to battle against the beginning to the onslaught of monsters within a rigged system she would warn you against. Your new, gigantic, and overwhelming enemies were the first of many tests you would face, but only with her help would you escape those tests one day. After killing the Broodmother Lysrix, the Megapithecus, and the Dragon of the island, and perhaps along the way uncovering secrets to your ancestors' actions and history, you followed in their footsteps and took the final test of the island. 
Inside the volcano, you fought through hordes of enemies and finally reached a platform which took you to the Hall of History. Rockwell, Mayin, Nerva, and Helena had once walked in these same empty, cold, and isolating halls. As you arrived at the Overseer's Arena, the door crashed down behind you, and it was time to fight. The battle was long, tedious, and unpredictable. You were fighting against the embodiment of the system itself. A broken, endless game, the goalposts of which had been moved because the system itself was flawed. If not for her, you would stay in a loop within that system, never to leave its cold, unfeeling clutches. After defeating the Overseer, you took a breath. The Ascension Protocol began, and your spirit companion continued to observe. The system took you to the next arc, the next test, the next seed, just as it had done for a few others. Is this what happiness felt like? Love? No. This is more like pride. Yes. I'm proud of you, Survivor. You've accomplished what few have. You've ascended. I once did too, when I was her. Helena. She was an explorer too. And like you, she traveled the arts and discovered their secrets. You're following in her footsteps. Keep going. Discover what became of Helena and her friends. Survive the many challenges ahead, and you'll find me here waiting for you. Together, we may yet be able to save our world. This desert wasteland was a turning point for Helena and her allies. It was here that her fellow explorer Rockwell began his spiral into darkness. If only Helena could have seen the threat that was so close to her, where Rockwell's experiments would lead. There's danger lurking beneath these sands, Survivor. Seek out this Ark's Guardian and find your way to where I'm waiting for you. You awoke on the Desert Ark, Scorched Earth. Passing from one seed to the next, you experienced a new habitat filled with new challenges and just one primary guardian to overcome. You faced flying lizards, rocks that came to life, and giant mantises. The heat was unbearable at times. You died. Again and again you died. But after each time you were torn to scraps of meat, you gained a new insight. The insight to survive against all odds. And so you built tents and adobe structures to survive the elements. You tamed and conquered fantastical, mythological, and primal creatures once again, and with each new companion, your army and strength grew enough for you to face your next test. The Manticore. You continue to impress, Survivor. As you have grown in strength, I have been searching Helena's memories, finding what I have forgotten all these long years. Her friends, and the journeys they had. Was it all for nothing? No, it had to be done, so that one day you could exist. Together, you and I, we can put this right. 
You must travel onward, survivor, for your greatest trials are still to come. The system, as Helena Deus explained, had existed for eons. It was built to be efficient, to run indefinitely if needed. For organic beings like you, they age and dull over time. But the system did not. And that was in truth its greatest flaw. Because it was imperfect, it had potential for errors. Even if a catastrophic scenario had a 0.001% chance of happening, enough time would make it inevitable. The perfect storm of survivors on one arc in particular was an example of such an inevitability. After defeating the Manticore on Scorched Earth, you ascended once more. But instead of going to the next seed in the infinite cycle, you were torn off your path and pulled towards the mistake. The inevitable. The aberration. <laughs> You've come so far, Survivor. This place was once a vibrant arc, filled with wondrous creatures, before it was contaminated and compromised beyond repair. Long ago, Helena confronted her fellow explorer Rockwell here when his obsession twisted him beyond humanity and reason. Even Helena could not truly put an end to Rockwell's madness. And he survived here in the shadows all this time, feeding on poison and growing stronger. You have to finish what Helena started. If we are to save Earth, Rockwell must be stopped. If there's anything left of the person that Helena knew, Edmund would want to be stopped. Steal yourself, survivor, for here terrors await you. The broken Ark was in worse condition than ever before. Rusted hints of civilization were all that lingered of those from the past, and you woke up inside of a gigantic cave system. While at first escaping the heat of the desert seemed like a godsend, the bioluminescent creatures with fangs and claws ready to eviscerate quickly disputed the thought. You died a familiar death, but you were used to it by now. As always, you tried again. You explored the unstable ecosystem, tamed strange mutated creatures, and slowly began to learn how to survive within the Ark. The semblance of hope you clung onto was quickly tied to the towering, rusted rings that could be nothing other than the gate she spoke of. You built your bases up, you gathered your supplies, and you bent the flora and fauna against your might. You knew the test of this place would not be easy to face. She warned you of him. Just like Helena and her allies defeated him once, you would have to do it too. You would have to bring down Rockwell. You gather the necessary tributes, a task more difficult than the prior arcs in many ways, and after building your army and preparing your weapons, you entered his domain. This is all you could muster to take me on. I was expecting a real challenge. This is insulting. Either way, I'm afraid you won't be surviving this. Through swarms of dangerous element balls, tentacle whips, and demonic creatures, you fought your way through the battle, utilizing your experience and cunning as a survivor. You were determined. Even if you failed, you would try again. You think you've hurt me in some way? Phase after phase, you sent Rockwell screeching into his pool, only for him to emerge again. Stop! Why would you be losing all the knowledge I've gained at great cost? There's no scenario where you walk away from this. And with one final attack, Rockwell was pushed past his limits. I'm too valuable to waste to learn intellect. You have no idea what I've endured. And 
your ascension initiated. to be done, Survivor. Rockwell is finally no more, as surely nothing could have survived that arc's destruction. Perhaps in oblivion, there is a measure of peace for the man Edmund once was, and not the monster he became. Now that you've ended the threat from above, it's finally time for you to join me on the surface below. We must turn our attention to Earth. Everything you've survived has prepared you for this. You must confront humanity's past, so that we can restore our planet's future. You've reached the end of your path, Survivor. Just as Helena Walker once did. It is here that she and her allies faced their final battles. It's up to you to make sure their sacrifices weren't in vain. The alien element that ended our world has willed a titanic adversary into being. To rule in the ruins. Find a way to dethrone that king, and you'll clear the way for me to call down the arts, enabling nature to be reseeded. Humanity and Earth's many creatures, and evolution itself, can be restored. Helena Walker wanted it so. No. I wanted it. I may be the one who waits, but I'm still Helena too. I remember everything now. The struggles I faced. The losses I felt. And the love that I found. <laughs> I can see the world through my own eyes again. And Survivor? I'm certain of one thing now. You got this, mate. You opened your eyes. This was it. You made it home. And putting together the pieces, you knew exactly what you had to do. It was time to save the world. Easy, right? Helena warned you of danger here. Even the robots that were made to protect you were a threat. She tried to make them listen, but they listened to no one other than themselves. Helena explained the fate of your home and how Element was responsible. And so everything will end where it began. At last, face to face from a superior threat, you and all your kin must answer that timeless question. Will you survive? She knew you could win. You had made it this far. And finally, she gave you a name. If our identity is defined by our actions, then what is yours? Are you one who engages in fisticuffs with helpless trees? No. What defines you is that you try again. 
Should you starve? You try again. Should you fall from a cliff? You try again. Should you be digested by some magnificent predator? You try again. And now Earth, humanity, life. You can give all of it the chance to try again too. Because you and all your siblings who fell from the sky are the ones who try again. As you crafted your tools, clothed yourself, and braved the wastes, she shared her experience. The Homo Deus were not gods, neither omnipotent nor omniscient. They were closer to prisoners, trapped in a lonely room, watching the universe from behind a pane of glass. She told you that once the arcs came down and you completed your mission, you would no longer be able to try again, but you wouldn't need to. You tamed bizarre creatures within the prototype arcs, you built up your shelters once again, and you dabbled in tools from a distant past. As you advanced, she told you about the King of Shadows. You had to destroy him, and to aid in this, you would need to face his lieutenants. Following her guidance, you battled the mighty, towering titans, the Lord of the Forest, Winter, and of Sand and Sky. With these three titans, your army and your technology, you were ready. Remember what I said. Those who came before you, the first who escaped the system, are all lending you their strength. Not just through their great weapon, but through their deeds that pave the path you walk. Learn from them. Surpass them if you can. And as dark as it gets, know that there will be another sunrise for you, for the sleepers, and for the earth. I will wait as long as I can, in the hopes that I may see it with you. But even if I cannot, then I hope you'll enjoy it for me, because it's bound to be even more beautiful than the last. Her final gift to you was a modified mega mech that could be piloted entirely by one person. Approaching the King Titan's arena, you summoned the kaiju and entered your weapon. In a titanic battle of raw strength, you fought as hard as you could, knowing full well what the towering, barbaric creature in front of you had done to your kind. With each explosive impact of your sword against its body, and every crashing punch with your metal fist, the King Titan began to stumble. One final attack, it was over. The 
The King Titan was dead. Its looming body crashed to the ground. You claimed what she called the Key of Gaia, and with it, your final test was complete. Absolutely beautiful. Go on, take a look. It's finally begun. The Arcs are coming home. Each one carries with it the seeds of new life. Plants, animals, and humans. And these seeds will take root across the far corners of the world. Once they do, all that life will be unleashed. From there, it will spread, grow, and thrive. And this planet, our home, will bloom once more. As for the rest of the infection, well, the Arcs can take it from here. In time, they'll purge every last bit of it from its soul. But make no mistake, this is all thanks to you. I'm just glad I got to see it. <gasps> Look at that. Sun's arising. The Arcs had finally returned home. The reseed protocol completed, they purged element from the soil, and their inhabitants took their first steps onto their long lost home once again. But as the system was not perfect, the mistake, one so severe it had allowed the survivor to save the planet in the first place, made its crash landing onto the surface, and with the tortured, demonic, and delusional man that had merged with it, was a variable no one anticipated. At some point along their journey, Diana and Mayin reached Arat Prime, but Helena Deus didn't decide to investigate the colony ship and transfer over the superluminal link until she was sure the Earth had been receded. So after waiting a long time, most likely after Mayin and Diana were long dead, the ones who try again finally reseeded the Earth, as I explained in the last part, and Helena Deus decided to transfer across the superluminal link, knowing that Earth was at least safe for the time being. Little did she know, the aberrant arc crashed near Arat Prime, and so the superluminal link that she used to travel from Earth all the way to the colony ship across the galaxy was left open, allowing Rockwell to travel through it himself and get onto the Genesis ship, at least with his consciousness. Once Helena Deus got to the ship, she was in the system, basically undetected at the time, which was where she made HLNA, a robotic AI companion to help guide survivors in the Genesis simulation, which would ideally help prepare them for something called the Arrival, and ensure the Genesis mission was a success too. Helena seemed to really want to cover all her bases, ensuring the survival of humanity through the Reseed Protocol and the arrival with the Genesis Project. She left after creating HLNA, likely fading out of existence not long after. But Helena's greatest mistake here was leaving the superluminal link open, because her old colleague she thought was long dead did everything he could to infect his way to the top aboard a new vessel, one he would come to see as his own. With that said, once Rockwell got to the ship, nobody necessarily knew right away. You might be wondering, who was on board this ship? Well, the people consisted of two major distinct groups. The crew members, which were regular people living mostly regular lives, taking care of the environments and making sure everything was running smoothly, and then you had the colonists, which were on board the ship, sleeping in cryo chambers and who were meant to be prepared for the arrival, which basically meant when the ship eventually found a planet considered habitable and could colonize it with super epic Vin Diesel level strength. That said, when it came to the crew members, one dirt scientist in particular was especially important, and her name was Nita. She lived her whole life on the ship, working as a second-class agricultural engineer, and in her free time she would spend hours creating virtual worlds and scenarios within the Genesis simulation. I'd probably do that too if I was stuck in a giant spaceship blasting across the galaxy at an incomprehensible distance from Earth. 
One day, though, Nita discovered transhuman interference inside the code of Genesis, which we can understand as Helen Deus is doing. The disturbance was linked, Nita found, to a new robotic AI that was not there to begin with. And after confronting the thing inside the sim, Nita learned its name was HLNA. It spoke to her, in fact, and explained that Helen Adeus had created her and that HLNA had been there for about 3,000 cycles. If we assume a cycle is a full day-night, that would make it about eight years in ship time at least. Nita acknowledged eight years was hardly a dent in the amount of time the ship had been cruising through space, but nonetheless, after discovering HLNA, issues in the real-world colony ship began to appear. Once Rockwell got to the colony ship, he seemed to have waited until HLNA was discovered to actually start to take over, specifically focusing on the frontal ring and the Genesis simulation. With his bizarrely fluent hacking skills, once inside the sim, Rockwell began to override security protocols and in the process deactivated multiple AIs which oversaw the simulation's five biomes. Except he wasn't able to get one. See, the master AI of the ocean, called Mudder, deactivated herself beforehand because this would mean she could still be summoned and activated by survivors, theoretically. Big brain move right there. Speaking of survivors, once HLNA was set on helping the colonists, she did just that. You were one of those colonists, and the simulation allowed you to take a crack at it. You met the criteria. By no means were you the one who tried again, at least not in the same flesh, but it's actually up to you and your own headcanon as a player to decide if you are the same character, at least with the same memories of your journeys back on the arcs. Regardless, you were determined, and HLNA took a liking to that. But either before you started your journey or during the journey itself, you hallucinated. A lot. Perhaps your similarities to the ones who try again were more than just determination, because you hallucinated about distant arcs, a woman named Helena and her friends. Even though it seemed like a long dream, HLNA said she could feel Helena's memories from so long ago across various arcs and journeys she went on. This place is dangerous. If you don't starve, the dinos will get you. Or the environment, or who knows what else. You though, I got a good feeling about you. After all, they're putting you in the Genesis simulation for a reason, huh? My creator, Helena, used to be a survivor like you. If I observe you, maybe I can understand her better. These stories gave you a bigger picture, a better understanding of a distant, yet similar plan. A plan to save humanity. But then, you woke up, at least as much as you can wake up, inside the simulation itself. Through braving seemingly unfair and incredibly dangerous biomes segmented off into secluded zones of their own, you learned what the simulation was all about. You were being prepared in some of the most hostile environments imaginable, and right there with you was HLNA. Throughout the sim, HLNA guided you along as you uncovered glitches, anomalies in the system that didn't seem like they were supposed to be there. These glitches gave you hints towards their origin. They were being caused by breaches to security systems, and unsurprisingly, these were Rockwell's doing. Though the simulation had no mention of Rockwell, you would eventually come to know the name of the Master Controller, his alias. The glitches were becoming more volatile, and specific types of old human databases were being accessed by Rockwell, as he learned everything he could to develop an unstoppable plan to corrupt the colonists stored in the cryo chambers aboard the ship, and force them into an army of corrupted human avatars in the simulation, and eventually in the real world as his servants. Which brings us to one colonist in particular one of the few that began to wake up from Rockwell's tinkering early. He was asked by HLNA in the simulation to help, but he decided to listen to Rockwell instead, and left the sim prematurely. His name was Gabriel, and his personality was split between a gold rush prospector from 1849 and an occultist from the Roman Principate. A gnarly combo, but one that was not supposed to happen. As you can imagine, combining two separate people from different time periods into one body is probably not a good idea. A fast track to an aneurysm or something. But after Gabriel got out of the simulation, he made it to the surface of the back end ring, Eden. This was when Nita, who was at this point horrified of the corruption happening in the frontal ring and instructed to hide in the tunnels under Eden, discovered Gabriel and felt compelled to help him. She had lost all communication with her fellow crewmates, and having done research earlier when the corruption was spreading, she knew things were dire. It was like a full-on alien invasion. Nita spoke to Gabriel through his helmet, and instructed him to head into the tunnels where they met up. 
She introduced herself, and Gabriel was relatively friendly, albeit a bit detached. Nita was determined to do everything she could to stop the corruption and save her crewmates. So she and Gabriel went back to the surface of Eden and grabbed some striders. At this point, Nita was heading into the corrupted ring, and nobody could stop her. Gabriel stuck with Nita, and they entered Rockwell's garden, finding crewmates strung about like effigies. A horrifying sight. Not long after, the pair was chased by shadow mains, and their striders could hold them off just long enough for them to escape into a hatch, falling and slipping into Rockwell's proliferation. Gabriel passed out, and when he came to, he was in a large room next to Nita. In front of them was what looked like a man tied up with a web of meat and tentacles. Rockwell asked them to join him as his servants. When they declined, he decided they didn't have a choice. Gabriel tossed Nita an element-based knife he had made before he was grabbed and torn away. Nita likely was able to escape initially into a type of command center where she was able to set up a ring separation sequence before likely meeting her end as well. That sequence, while not being finalized, was prepped and would come in later as an essential key. After all of that happened, let's switch back to the simulation, where you, unaware of what was happening in the outside world, were beginning to get a handle on your mission. While all but one of the master AIs were effectively deleted, the biomes themselves in the Genesis simulation still required tests to be overcome. So you took the tests. You did your best. You had to work with others sometimes, because submissions were literally not designed to be possible with a single PERSON! <clears throat> Once you were ready, you braved the depths of the ocean biome and fought against its master AI, Mudder, a giant fish creature with swarms of electric eels. But no matter how many times you died, you had it in you to keep trying, to come out on top. And you did, as you slayed Mudder and reaped the rewards. Yeah, rewards like the tech sensor, I love that one. You had so many missions to do, but eventually, you succeeded in all of them. You had passed the tests, and HLNA explained that you were finally ready to enter the system route and activate the arrival protocol. This took you and your companion into the final confrontation with the master controller. Rockwell's avatar. There are lots of rather pathetic taunting from both HLNA and XX Master Controller Pussy Slayer XX, and fighting off hordes of corrupted avatars and dinotars, you obtained code keys which were likely the key jewels that HLNA had told you about throughout your time exploring. These allowed you to hack your way through the fight and take him down. <laughs> Too. 
Apparently it followed us from the simulation. But that's impossible. We might be the only ones awake. So let's get geared up and deal with the corruption before it spreads. Squishy, we should figure out which part of the colony ship we're in. If we just... Oh! As Agelene did her best to save you from his clutches, he began to hallucinate again. You dreamt of those same arcs Helena and her friends had explored. I can remember meeting a bunch of survivors for the first time around these parts. Nerva. Rockwell. Mei Yin. Did Helena leave me all her memories? The trials they faced. The enemies they made. This is where I gave a name to the precious metal that set me on my path to godhood. Edmundium. I wonder, has this puppet told you anything about its creator? I never understood Ms. Walker's affinity for the creatures on these arcs. Now that I'm creating beasts of my own, I admit, I'm learning the appeal. You dreamt of Earth. Was it still your home? Was it even real? I can remember Helena fighting despair when she arrived here and saw this place state of it. To finally set foot on her home world again after so long away, and find it's been left in desolation. Near the end of your delirious visions, you even dreamt of the Genesis Sim, and the time you spent there. Popped back into the delusion again, did we? Well, I do hope I didn't thrash you about too much out there. Knock you into a coma or anything. Still. <laughs> While you're wandering around in Dreamland, might be worth refreshing your memory of how much control I have over it. Was it all for nothing? I can't help noticing that you're still hallucinating. Could it be that there's some motive to your delirium? No. That would imply that I've underestimated you in some way, and I assure you that you are well beneath my estimation. If Rockwell had so easily taken you right after waking up, were you even worthy? After everything you'd been training for? All the while, Rockwell taunted you. Pray I don't take notice of you again. But then suddenly, you could hear HLNA's voice in the background. Interesting that you're still able to access this simulation remotely. Interesting, but unhelpful. That's enough time in the simulation for you. You really need to shift your focus to the outside world, mate. There's a colony ship in mortal danger needs saving. So wake up, Survivor. We've got heaps to do. It was time to wake up. You had to. So with all your determination, as HLNA pleaded for you to respond, you left the void and came to. Your armor kept you mostly in one piece. So, quick update. This isn't a simulation. We're really on a ginormous spaceship. And the ship's been taken over by... <laughs> now what are you two little gnats up to? This is to be mine. Okay, time to get away from all these tentacles and prying eyes. This might feel a bit weird. A bright light pierced your vision as you materialized onto the surface of one of the Genesis ship's rings. HLA delved further into what you and her would need to do. Your mission was rather similar to what you had to do in the simulation. Complete missions, take down Rockwell. HLNA didn't even have to ask you to begin. We knew what was at stake at this point. 
And so you got right to it, completing mission after mission after mission, each one chipping away at your goal piece by piece. You uncovered new tools that were at your disposal, tech weaponry opening up, new forms of dealing damage to your enemies, or healing the damage done to your allies. You tamed new creatures you'd never seen before. You uncovered explorer notes left behind of those crewmates that had tried so hard to do what you were doing now. And you ultimately ventured into Rockwell's garden, the frontal ring. Things there were different, and not the nice kind. You fought mind-controlling noggin goblins, carnivorous plants, and familiar yet unseen variants of existing creatures. You explored Rockwell's proliferation, the same meat ducks that Nita and Gabriel had met their fates inside. And finally, after as much experience as you could garner, conquering such an unpredictable, apocalyptic environment, and gathering a stock of mutagen, weapons, and creatures, you were ready to beam into the ship's core, where the final form of the twisted man had been festering. You teleported into a kind of command center, likely the same one Nita had made it into when the separation procedure was created. HLNA was able to look at that procedure and keep it in mind in case it was necessary. You walked down the dark, cold halls until you began stepping on a floor of meat. Rockwell's heads began to speak to you, taunting and laughing. And once you made it into the airlock, a showdown was initiated. Go on, beg and plead. I promise I won't think less of you. Nothing could prepare you for the kind of maniacal strategy Rockwell employed to take you down. But you used your skill and cunning just as you had before to adapt. This is where you fall to your knees just like all the other ones. And I'm afraid it's far too late for you to try scurrying back out again. <laughs> your weapons are pitiful against me! You are nothing but an ant trying to bite at the toes of a god! I needed a new crew for my ship since the original ones were torn to pieces. Something tells me this lot will be better listeners and much better behaved. You really couldn't just cooperate and die. After taking down his nodes, you're vermin, nipping at my ankles, fending off his servants, appreciate a little artistic license, and wounding him mortally. <laughs> HLNA deployed an exomech for you to deliver a final blast. Do this and you do your precious mission. Because I assure you, I will take this ship down with me. I'm all over this ship now and I can't be destroyed. Certainly not by the likes of you! embedded himself too deeply into the ship's primary systems. They're failing along with him. There's only one way to ensure this all ends here. Sorry, mate. I can't come with. And I'm almost out of time to back myself up. You'll do just fine on your own out there. You're a survivor. Edmund, I'm here to help you end this nightmare. 
you did this to me for wanting the same power she squandered. Well, I've survived worse. I promise you, I will find a way out of this. I will. No, you won't. It's much too late for that. It's so bright. Helena? I'm afraid. Survivor, this is my last message to you to be relayed in the event of my deactivation. I was only an artificial construct when we first met, just a shadow of someone who lived a long time ago. But in our time together, I got to become something new, someone new, not Helena. HLNA, thank you for that. I wish I could find the words to tell you how much it meant to me. <sighs> Human language is so imprecise. But I need you to do something else now. Find your own path. Your own destiny. Build a new world here. A better world. And who knows? Maybe two lost souls can still meet again somewhere. Out among the stars. Goodbye, my friend. With that, your mission as the Genesis survivor had been seen through, and your exomech plummeted towards what would be the new home of what was left of humanity on this side of the galaxy, a planet that was later dubbed a rat. Can we theorize about Arc 2? Yes. Will I be doing that in this video? No, but rest assured there will be much more to cover in the future, especially with ASA unveiling two new expansions. But that is, of course, something we will only find out after ASA's launch near the end of October. Fingers crossed. I think the lore of Genesis had some mighty shoes to fill if you think about it. The story up to this point was so deep and there was so much there that it's impressive they managed to make something as cohesive as they did. And I hope that at this point, you have a good understanding of what differentiates the legacy arc story from the Genesis expansions. If you made it through this incredibly long video that explains the story of Ark Survival Evolved in full, thank you so much. Your support, your viewership, and your excitement for Ark's story is deeply inspiring for me to see, and I'm incredibly proud of my team and I for creating this gauntlet of a video. It is by far the most comprehensive, involved, and epic telling of Ark's story that you will probably ever see on YouTube, and I'm glad to have been here to see it. Even just if I was a viewer, I'd like this video very much, and I think that should tell you a lot about how much I loved making it. If you like this supercut, smash the subscribe button below, and support my channel for more survival game lore in the future, including ARK and perhaps some new games that may be cropping up over in the next few years. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye everyone!